can start. All cool. yours. Thank you very much, Anita, uh, for the instruction and also for the invite. Um, and yeah, so I want to talk about um, triangle factors in pseudorandom graphs. This is uh, something that um, is very it's sort of dear to me and something that I've thought about for a long time. So it's great to be able to uh, share some results with you. Um, so the main uh, topic is, um, or yeah, concept is that of a triangle factor, uh, which is just vertex disjoint triangles um, in a graph which cover the vertex set. Um, so I think I've got an example. Uh, so here's a graph and here's uh, a triangle factor within that graph. And um, yeah, so maybe to give it also a real world example, if you've never seen this, these things before, um, perhaps you're ordering, perhaps you're organizing a conference uh, and you want a seating plan and due to COVID restrictions, you can only have three people at a table um, and you also don't want uh, any spread, the, the conference dinner to cause any further spread of the virus. So you want people to sit with people that they've already had contact with. Um, so then what you would need is, um, is a triangle factor uh, amongst the graph, which encodes uh, which people have had contact with each other. Um, okay, so these things are um, actually uh, very useful in um, applications, but also theoretically interesting. Um, the very natural generalization of a, of a perfect matching. Um, and uh, they've been very well studied. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the obvious question is to ask when a graph has um, a triangle factor. And one thing you notice straight away is that um, you have a necessary condition that the number of vertices must be divisible by three. Um, but given this, it's actually uh, an NP complete problem to um, determine whether a certain graph has a triangle factor. I should say, by the way, if anyone, if anything is unclear at any point, I don't mind taking questions uh, during the talk. Um, okay, so what we, so given that it's hard to determine uh, whether a graph has a triangle factor, we look for simple conditions, easy to verify conditions that guarantee a triangle factor. And, and the classic extremal result in this um, in this area is that of Corelli and Heinel, which gives a minimum degree condition uh, guaranteeing a triangle factor. So n throughout the talk is just the number of vertices of the graph. And yeah, and the delta is the, this minimum degree. Um, and this is tight, uh, as can be seen by the following example. Um, so this is nothing more than uh, we've taken a complete graph. And on the left here, we've taken a set of size n over 3 plus 1 and removed all the edges within it. So this is an independent set on the left. Um, and uh, and all other edges are there. OK. And um, yeah, and the way to see that this is does not have a triangle factor is that um, every triangle can only take one of the vertices on the left. Um, but in a triangle factor, we, we will have n over three triangles. So there's simply not enough triangles in a triangle factor to cover this set on the left. Um, OK, so this is, uh, if you think about this example, um, and in fact, all examples that we know that are close to tight uh, sort of seem quite derived and far from typical. In particular, they have these large uh, independent sets. Um, so in order to capture more graphs uh, that have triangle factors, sparser graphs, then we could hope that if we impose some typicality, some um, pseudo random conditions on the graph, that we actually capture much more. And uh, this can be made formal um, by looking at, at pseudo random graphs. So there's several ways of, um, of making this idea of a graph appearing random uh, formal. Today, I want to concentrate on uh, ND lambda graphs, which is a, a, a very nice um, connection, like spectral connection. Um, so a graph is an ND lambda graph. Uh, if so we have these three parameters so again as always the n is the number of vertices uh we're going to concentrate on d regular graphs today everything i say um sort of can be 
uh, translated to things that are not deregular, but for convenience, um, we'll concentrate on deregular graphs. Uh, lambda, this, this parameter takes a bit of uh, explanation. So if you uh, take the adjacency graph, or uh, adjacency matrix of a graph, um, then it's a symmetric zero one matrix. So it has a real spectrum. Um, so you can order the eigenvalues. And then this lambda, we call it the second eigenvalue of the graph. Uh, in reality, it's like the second eigenvalue in absolute value. Okay. And um, the uh, perhaps surprising thing is that this parameter controls the pseudo randomness of a graph. Okay. So if lambda is small, um, then the graph will be more pseudo random. And we'll, we'll make this more explicit in a second. Um, let me first say, uh, how small it can be. So it turns out if for any ND lambda graph, if D is reasonable, so not too dense, um, then lambda will be at most D um, and at least of the order of root D. Okay, so these uh, these graphs where, where, where lambda is of the order of root D, we think of being um, optimally pseudo-random. Okay, so they're as pseudo-random as, as we can get. For example, if you took a random regular graph um, for all the whole range of D, then it would have this lambda uh, of the order of square root D. Okay, and there's particular interest in, in, in understanding these optimally pseudo-random graphs. Um, okay, uh, so let's get a little more uh, hands-on. So what do I mean by lambda controlling the pseudo-randomness? So this comes in um, the form of what's known as the, the expander mixing lemma. And so if you take any two vertex sets of your graph, um, A and B, EAB here is counting the number of um, edges with one vertex in A and the other in B. Um, and so D over N is the density of our graph. So we would expect in a random graph of this density, we would ex expect to see uh, this many edges. Hopefully you can see my, my cursor. Um, and uh, right, so that, so what the expanded mixing lemma is saying is that lambda is controlling the, the discrepancy from this random paradigm. Okay, so we expect this many, how many do we actually have is controlled by lambda. And if lambda is small, then uh, we're closer in edge distribution um, to what we expect in a random graph. Okay, so the pseudo randomness that we're looking at is, is in terms of edge distribution between vertex sets and uh, note that it's really between any two vertex sets. So it's, it's a global uh, condition. Okay, and um, yes, so now we have this concept of pseudo randomness, you can ask um, what conditions on the pseudo random parameters uh, guarantee a certain property that you're interested in, for example, containing a triangle factor. And um, this was conjectured by Krivelovich, uh, Sudakov and Sabo in 2004, that this condition, so lambda should be little o of uh, d squared over n, would force a triangle factor uh, in an nd lambda graph. Okay, um, so let me, uh, yeah, to, to ease things, if you if this is um, like if like me, you find these free working with these free parameters a little confusing. Uh, what we can do is also focus on optimally pseudo random graphs. So there we're going to fix uh, look at only graphs where the lambda is of the order of root d, and then this becomes a density question. Okay, and then this is just saying that as soon as your uh, degrees are at least into the two thirds then you'll get a triangle factor. And here you see that we, we really um, achieved our aim because compared to karate Heinel, where you need the degrees to be linear, um, we've, we're now capturing much sparser graphs and uh, calculating the second eigenvalue is, a, is something that we could do quickly, efficiently. Um, so it, it's a, yeah, we, we capture many more, much sparser graphs, which contain a triangle factor. And with this added addition of pseudo randomness. Um, okay, so why is this a, a, a natural thing to conjecture? Um, so there's a construction of um, Nogolon, which shows that this would be tight. 
Okay, so this is a um, triangle free uh, ND lambda graph. It's optimally pseudo random. So the lambda is of the order of root D and it can't contain a uh, triangle factor um, because it doesn't even contain any triangles. Okay. And this is maybe um, one of the reasons why this, this conjecture has attracted a lot of attention, which I'll go through shortly, um, is that this, um, this idea that, this, that the triangle factors appear with this condition sort of sets apart optimally pseudo random graphs from random graphs. So in, in the world of random graphs, we know that as we increase the, the density, um, we can expect more and more things to happen. We, uh, we have certain thresholds for, for certain properties. We start to get triangles at around one over N, density one over M. Um, and then we have to get quite a bit denser, uh, N to the minus two thirds log into the third uh, to, get, um, to get a triangle factor. Um, whereas in pseudo, optimally pseudo random graphs, we can get actually really dense and not even have a triangle. This is this construction of a long. Um, and then we just have to push it a constant factor um, above and suddenly we, we get triangles. In fact, we get the whole triangle factor. So that's what this conjecture says. Um, I should say this construction uh, of Alon, there's now um, several others that, that do this or close to this. So Conlon had one recently, uh, Squastic Kapati as well, so has a, an algebraic one. Um, yeah, this comes from a, a Cayley graph. Um, so it's an algebraic, uh, yeah, definition. Okay, so what uh, progress was made on this conjecture? Um, so one thing you can do is fix this condition. So this is the condition that we expect to give a, a triangle factor and ask what we can find. Okay, so what evidence can we find that a tri triangle factor exists? And uh, this was started by Krivelovich, Sudokov and Sabo. So they showed the existence of a fractional triangle factor. Um, so what does this mean? So uh, if it's a function that you, um, a, you give every uh, triangle in the graph, so this triangle of G is or the set of triangles, um, you give each one a weight between zero and one. And your condition is that at every vertex, if I sum the weights, of the triangles that appear at that vertex, uh, then this should sum to one, okay? So note that if um, if I impose that the weights are zero, one, just, uh, just zero and one, then I recover the notion of a triangle factor. It's a very complicated way of saying that every vertex should be in exactly one triangle. Um, but, so this is a natural generalization, a natural relaxation of the, of the notion. And they proved that this condition is enough for this uh, to get a fractional triangle factor. Um, a year later, so this is maybe not directly, but um, I also see this as evidence. Uh, Sulikov, Sabo, and Vu showed that the triangles are very well distributed around such a graph. Okay, so with this condition, um, we we have triangles, but we have triangles everywhere. This is like a Turan type. Uh, result, it tells you that you need to delete at least half of the edges in order to eliminate all the triangles. And uh, more recently, um, Jihan, Yoshika Hayakawa, and Yuri Person um, proved that uh, this condition is good enough for a near triangle factor. So this means um, triangles covering all but some polynomially small uh, number of vertices. Okay, and so it's, so it's not hard to show that you can cover all but um, some small linear number, but getting uh, polynomially smaller is, is a challenge. Okay, um, and uh, the other thing you can do, of course, is ask what conditions um, do guarantee a triangle factor. So can we strengthen the conditions to find a triangle factor? Uh, and this was again started by Krivelovich, Sukov, and Sabo. So they gave this condition. Um, and then uh, these authors, Alan Butcher, Han, Kayakawa, and Person, different Han, this is Kiep Han, as can be uh, told by the accent. Uh, so they strengthened the condition, and their condition, in fact, they, um, 
they could show slightly more. So they were finding uh, squares of Hamilton cycles. So it's a super graph for the triangle factor with this condition. Uh, and then very recently, uh, Raikon Nenadov got very close to the conjectured value. Um, so we're just within a log factor. Um, and I, if you translate these to looking at optimally pseudo random graphs, then you really clearly see the um, decrease in density um, as, as these results came out. Okay. And um, ah, that's, you can't see this, uh, <laughs> but um, this is uh, another related result. It's not directly related. So everything I say has a, a, a sort of parallel world um, for larger clique factors. So we can look for K4 factors, K5 factors. And um, there's some slight differences which I'll, I'll come to at the end. Um, but in terms of these upper bounds of finding clique factors, most of these bounds come with a, um, uh, a, a condition that, um, so that the proof methods uh, generalize to other clique factors. And in 2019, uh, myself and um, Yuri, Yoshi, and Gia um, had a result on larger clique factors, so KR factors. Um, and it was, it would have improved on the current best known at that time, which was this Alan Butcher, Hank Hayakawa person, um, for large cliques, so for, for um, cliques of size at least four. Unfortunately, at the same time, uh, we didn't know, but Raiko was working on this and he had uh, a much, his approach was much stronger for almost the full range. Um, and, and his approach also generalizes to larger cliques. So it was, it was sort of a, a better result than ours, apart from when a graph is very, very dense. Uh, so this, uh, this result here, I just list it because um, in fact, the, the proof techniques were, were useful, um, which I'll get to shortly. And yeah, so that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about uh, a recent um, result of mine, which is that the conjecture does indeed hold. Um, and in fact, uh, we can we know more than this. We actually know that every um, that a, such a pseudo random graph is two universal. So it contains any subgraph, any possible subgraph on up to n vertices, uh, which has a degree at most two maximum degree at most two. And um, the reason why I, I say this is a corollary, so we actually, um, we proved this with RICO's uh, condition, so with the extra log n, um, but it followed from our proof that the, the triangle factor was really the sticking point. Um, so that removing the condition on the triangle factor would in fact uh, give this for the same condition for, for uh, two universality. Okay. Um, Excuse me. So that's really it contains all of these graphs at the same time, right? Because so now there's no randomness, so yeah. we don't have to. Um, yeah, there's no <clears throat> because it's a deterministic thing. It uh, you automatically get um, all of them at once. Yeah. Are there any other questions? This is a good chance to pause before I talk about proof. Okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah, for the rest of the talk, I want to I want to give some ideas of the proof, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's fair to say that uh, the proof really builds on on almost all of the the results I listed on the last two pages. So the previous um, results towards the conjecture, and many of those ideas. Um, yeah, came up uh, in the proof, and then and then obviously had to push a little further. Um, so the main idea is is a, an absorption, um, which is uh, some of you will be familiar with, but if not, let me um, give an idea. So one thing that you can easily show happens with this condition is uh, that you you find triangles within between any uh free linear sets okay 
Um, so this just follows, it's really from the expanded mixing lemma. Um, you find some vertex with a uh, normal degree and what you degree what you expect, and then you have um, the expanded mixing lemma will give an edge within its neighborhood. Okay, so what we can do is sort of greedily pull out triangles. So we just split, find three linear size sets, find a triangle, and take that into our factor and repeat and repeat and repeat until we can't any longer. Okay, so uh, this is easy to do, but then we're left with some very small linear set. Um, or sublinear, if you like, and we don't uh, we don't know. Uh, I mean, we, we we have no guarantee that there is a triangle in there, so we're, we're kind of stuck at this point. Um, so the idea of absorption is simply just to to have some foresight uh, for this situation. So what we do is we put aside an absorbing structure uh, on some vertices, and then we run. Um, the same idea, we greedily find triangles, cover almost everything, and we end up with some small leftover. And now um, the absorbing structure will be defined in such a way that no matter what leftover uh, set of vertices I have here, there will always be a triangle factor on the vertices of A and the leftover vertices. Okay, so the, the hard thing. Um, is how do we define such an absorbing structure how, and then how do we find it in our um, in our graph so it's a very strong property because it has the ability to absorb any leftover okay so this is the challenge and um, in order to do that we're going to use these small building blocks uh, which are called diamond trees um, so what is this so it's maybe best with a picture, but it's just, you, so you take a tree and um, an auxiliary tree, say, say this one, and then the diamond tree sort of generated by it is um, what happens if you replace every edge with a K4 minus, so a diamond, um, in such a way that the, uh, the original vertices of the tree are the degree two vertices in the K4 minus and all the new vertices are new. Okay, so it's, it's just this. Um, and you can do this for, for any tree. And I'm going to say that the order of the tree is uh, the, so the order of the diamond tree is the order of the tree that defines it. Okay. And um, yeah, so every diamond tree has roughly 3M uh, vertices where M is the order. Slightly less. Um, okay, so why is this uh, thing useful for us? So uh, the point is that a diamond tree can contribute to a triangle factor in many ways. Um, so there, it has this set of uh, removable vertices, which are the, the vertices of the original tree. Um, and, uh, and these vertices are called removable because uh, they have the property that if I, for any single one of these, if I remove it, the remaining structure has a triangle factor, okay? So for example, uh, this vertex here, if I um, prohibit the use of this vertex, then I get a triangle factor on the remaining vertices like this. And I could also uh, prohibit this one, and I get this triangle factor. And it's not hard to prove that um, you can do this for any removable vertex. Okay, so just uh, to recap, um, given a tree, we get a corresponding diamond tree given by replacing all the edges by diamonds. This comes with a set of M removable vertices, the order of the tree, and uh, we get a triangle factor on every, um, if we remove, for each vertex, if we remove it, we get a triangle factor on what remains. And uh, another thing that we need uh, is that we can find these things in our uh, pseudo random graph. So, um, so uh, by the way, I've yeah, I've fixed now some pseudo random graph with this condition. Uh, everything I say is relative to this. 
Um, so if we have this condition that comes from the conjecture, um, then in any linear size set, we can find a large diamond tree. Okay. And, um, and notice that this means we can find diamond trees of any size because you can easily uh, crop a diamond tree just by removing leaves um, to get a, a tree of your uh, desired size. Okay. And so this is not this is not too hard to prove. It's it's not immediate from the expander mixing lemma, um, but there's several ways of of seeing this. It's maybe a good exercise. Um, okay, so now in order to really use the power of diamond trees, uh, they, we need to collect them together into uh, what I call orchards, um, and this is supposed to be uh, this this terminology is supposed to be a hint. Um, so an orchard is just a, um, it's like a forest, except uh, more ordered. Um, and so it's, it's, it's nothing more than a collection of vertex disjoint diamond trees, um, but we have some, yeah, some organization. So M um, with these two parameters, this M is the order of the orchard. Um, so all the diamond trees in the orchard have the same size, same order, okay? Same number of vertices. Uh, and the K then is just uh, the, size, the number of diamond trees in the orchard, okay? Um, so it's, just, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's a simple concept. We'll see an example in a second. Um, and the point is that uh, if we group these um, diamond trees together in an orchard, then they have absorbing power. Okay, so I need to tell you what it means for one orchard to absorb another orchard. So um, O here we think of as a big orchard, and R we think of as a small orchard. Again, we'll see a picture in a second. Um, and I'll give the definition, but uh, yeah, maybe the picture is, is, is more telling. Um, so it's what you expect. So um, here's my large orchard. Here's my small orchard R. And uh, I say O absorbs R if we can include the vertices of R into triangles using some of the vertices of O. And we're always gonna do this in the following way. Um, we're gonna find a triangle which traverses one removable vertex of a diamond tree in R and two and a, and a removable vertex of two of the diamond trees in O. And because of what we had our fact earlier that when we remove a removable vertex, this sort of cascades into a, a triangle factor on these uh, diamond trees, okay? Um, and again, if O absorbs R, the key thing is that everything in R is now covered with a triangle, but not necessarily everything in O. So this orchard uh, could have um, diamond trees remaining. In fact, it probably will. Um, okay, and um, good. Yes, yeah, so this is what the concept of um, absorbing an orchard. And now the key, a key lemma in the proof is, uh, morally that larger orchards absorb small orchards. So we have some conditions on when an orchard absorbs another, okay? So again, we're always thinking of O here as the large one and R as the small one. And um, yeah, so when I say large, I mean, um, so you should think larger in both size and order, okay? So order again is the number of vertices in a diamond tree or proportional to the number of vertices in a diamond tree in the orchard. And the size is the number of diamond trees in the orchard. And both of these things should be larger in the larger orchard, okay? Um, and so now we have some conditions. So the first thing is that the, uh, the larger orchard should be take, should have to cover a linear number of vertices. Um, and secondly, uh, is that the, the smaller orchard should be small in, in terms of 
uh, size. So um, this is the number of, of diamond trees in the smaller orchard should be less than the number of diamond trees in the large orchard um, over 32. Or, I mean, this is somewhat arbitrary, but some uh, constant. Um, and this is, uh, if you think back to that picture, this is expected because um, we sort of need space in the larger orchard to absorb um, the, the small one. So for every diamond tree in the small orchard, uh, we, we need two of the diamond trees in the large orchard above. So we need there to be sort of lots of, lots of options. Um, and then this, this condition I don't expect um, you to sort of see is something that comes out of the proof. But what it says is that there's a payoff. Um, so if your, um, so the difference in sizes is purport can be proportional to the difference in orders. So if I'm much smaller in size, so my, so my little K is much smaller than my big K that allows my big M to be large compared to my little I. Okay. So if I, so there's a payoff, if, yeah, if my sizes are, um, the difference in sizes is large, then the difference in orders can be large, but not, yeah, and the other way around as well. Um, and finally, we have, yeah, a bit of a technical thing that um, we can't have that our, that our small orchard uh, has some, some bad vertices, um, but this is, this is something that's easy to, to implement in applications, so uh, yeah, I think for today we can basically ignore this um but yeah there, there'll be some some badly behaved vertices but we can control their size and we can we can avoid them okay so now we have the following idea um which we call a cascading uh absorption um so i realize there's a lot in this picture so this is the same as the picture that we had um, at the beginning, except I've really zoomed in on A, okay? So actually this is the majority of the graph, but everything from the, the um, to the right of this dotted line or dashed line is my absorbing structure, okay? So I wanna convince you now that if I, that I can define an absorbing structure that does what I said it would do in the beginning, that it has the ability to swallow up any leftover leftover vertices. Um, okay, so what is this absorbing structure? So I've split it into levels, there's T of them, and each level contains an orchard, okay? Um, and each orchard is taking place on a linear number of vertices. And I start with uh, orchards which are very small uh, in order, um, but large in size, okay? So these have order two, there's two removable vertices in each diamond tree, and there's gonna be linearly many of them. And now from uh, going from one level to the next, I have, um, I double the order and half the size. So now these diamond trees have order four, there's four removable vertices in each diamond tree, and there's half as many um, diamond trees as there are, as there were in the first orchard. And I continue this process right up until the end. So at this point, I have uh, diamond trees whose order is linear. So every, every diamond tree in this last orchard has linearly many vertices. Um, literally many removable vertices also, and there's constantly many of them, okay? And I'm, I see Anita frowning, uh, <laughs> which is good. I'll, I'll, there's a problem with this picture, which I'll get back to in a second. Um, okay, but let's see why this- I was this... wondering what is constant. Wouldn't you just be happy with one in the last in OT? Um, so you need, we're going to need some uh, constant uh, 
it's going to be some large, it's got to be some large constant. Okay. Or, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how small the constant can be, but definitely it works with a large constant. Okay. We'll see, we'll see, I guess. We can figure out. Um, okay, so let's see why this absorbs. So as we did in the beginning, we, can, we would greedily fill up most of the graph and we would end up with some small leftover. And the leftover vertices now itself is an orchard. The diamond trees have order one, there's just one vertex, they're a singular vertex. And um, by sort of pushing our, um, our condition, uh, using our condition, we can make sure that this is really small, some really small leftover number of vertices. And then we have this lemma, which tells us that uh, this small orchard can be absorbed by this large orchard. The large, large orchard is the whole of O of one. And let's check uh, that it really is um, uh, small compared to this. So I, I told you that we can force this to be sort of as small as we like. Um, so it will be smaller in size. And also these are vertices, these are diamond trees of order one, these are diamond trees of order two. Um, so we're gonna be good. Okay. Yeah. So this whole lemma from the previous slide, this yes. all takes place in a large pseudorandom graph G. So there are the yeah. usual assumptions. Yes, exactly. So the this is um, in any pseudorandom graph with my uh, given condition, lambda equals little o of d squared over n, um, I can expect this to happen for any, for any um, O and R such that blah, 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 uh, I'll have this absorption property. Uh, okay, so I can absorb the leftover with some uh, diamond trees in uh, the first orchard. And now, um, so this uses up some of the first orchard. And now I can uh, greedily choose triangles covering most of the first orchard. Um, so I always just, um, I told you that every time I have a linear, uh, linear size sets, I get a triangle. So I can split all the diamond trees into three groups and find a triangle that traverses a removable vertex, a removable vertex, a removable vertex. And I can repeat this until I'm, I've covered most of uh, the first orchard with triangles. So I have some small leftover uh, diamond trees in the first orchard. And now um, this leftover set of diamond trees is a small orchard compared to O2, compared to the, the second orchard. Small in both size and order. And so we know that we can absorb this leftover using some diamond trees in O2. And we cascade uh, our absorption through these layers. So again, we find greedily, find triangles covering most of O2. We have some small leftover. We use O3 to absorb the leftover. We cover most of O3, etc. And this goes all the way through until we end up right at the um, at the, the end here. So what happens once we've got all the way to OT? So now at this point, we've used some, um, some diamond trees in the last orchard to absorb the leftover of the previous orchard. But now we're in a situation where all the diamond trees in this orchard that remain have um, linear number of vertices. And so we can just greedily find um, we can split them into, into triples and greedily find a triangle traversing their removable vertices because they now have linear size. So this is, uh, this then covers everything. And um, yeah, so this is, um, there is a problem here, uh, which is 
that I kind of lied. So I, I said um, that every, well, in order to use, uh, maybe I have it here. Yeah, in order to use this, this lemma, um, this absorbing uh, orchard lemma, uh, I need that every orchard takes place on a linear number of vertices. This is uh, something that I told you happens. But I also told you that uh, in between orchards, the size, the, the order is, um, is doubling. Okay, the order of each diamond tree is doubling uh, until we, and we go from or, uh, diamond trees of order two to diamond trees that are linear in size. So this means that we need log, log n layers, log n orchards. And there's simply no, not enough space for this. We can't have log n orchards each taking place on a linear number of vertices. Um, so what I've told you just now is, um, is basic, is Ryko's proof. Um, so Ryko Nenadov's proof that got within a log factor. So if you impose this extra log n in the, in the pseudo randomness, um, suddenly there's space. So everything sort of works a log factor down. So I can now find triangles, for example, um, traversing sets of size n over log n. Um, and that allows, uh, and I can also find um, this absorbing between orchards will work if the, if the big orchard takes place on n over log n vertices instead. So I can, I can, I can shrink these orchards slightly so there still will be log n of them, but now they each take place on a, on a set of size n over log n roughly. Um, so there's space and I can do this. And this is, this is exactly uh, what Ryko, Ryko did. And I should say also, this is, um, yeah, this is inspired uh, by uh, Kravelevich, um, whose uh, proof on, on finding triangle factors in random graphs. So it, it wasn't the right threshold at the time, it was the best known um condition uh, they also use this cascading sort of absorption idea and it's actually that's credited often as one of the first appearances of uh, the absorption method okay um so what time am i finishing mm, i don't know five five to ten minutes okay cool yeah so let me um sketch a little bit about how to go further so so how do we remove this log n um so uh one thing we can do is try and find so in order to um so we have this payoff right this is this this payoff condition tells me that um i can only jump in orders uh as much as i jump in size so if we look at this picture again um if I want to have constantly many layers, then I really need to be jumping in large chunks, uh, like jumping in in um, in order uh, by bigger steps. Um, so I want to say that okay, here I have order two, but here I have like n to the epsilon, order n to the epsilon, and in order to do this and maintain the the absorbing between orchards. I need that um, the size of the leftover then must be very small. Okay, so this um, suggests uh, that we need to find orchards which contain um, near triangle factors. So uh, triangle, we can't just do the greedy thing of finding triangles until we have some small linear number of vertices left over. We have to somehow push that further until we have polynomially small number of vertices left over. Um, and it turns out this is, this is possible. This is sort of the technical uh, proposition, but it's just, yeah, you can read it if you like, it's just what I'm saying. We need to cover almost everything, um, leaving only like n to the one minus epsilon vertices remaining. Um, the, the reason this is a bit more technical is because we have to take to, into account the fact that um, uh, we need flexibility from the layer before. So if I'm in an orchard in a layer, I'm going to use some of the some of my diamond trees to absorb the layer below, and I want that this doesn't mess up my property. So I want that whatever uh, is removed, I can still 
find a triangle uh, factor or the triangles cover different triangles covering almost everything. Um, and and um, for this, the um, the work of uh, Jihan Yoshikai Okawa and Yuri Person was very relevant because uh, what did they do? They showed that um, in a pseudo random graph with our condition, we can find triangles covering all but a polynomially small number of vertices. So this is, they were working in the, uh, the orchard, which is all the vertices of the graph. And these are order one uh, diamond trees. Um, and so, so, so we use some their methods or build on their methods, uh, which in turn uses the fractional triangle factors. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's linear programming and, and duality comes into it um, and these sort of tactics in order to, to get such a uh, proposition. Um, and uh, yeah, and then this is still not enough. So if you imagine then that we're finding each time we're not covering, uh, so we're finding we're leaving some polynomially small n to the one minus epsilon um, uh, vertices um, left over within each orchard at each step. Um, but this is still not enough because this allows us to jump in in steps of n to the epsilon. Um, but this would still take so this would give like a log log n condition as opposed to a log n condition. Um, so in order to, to uh, get the for conjecture, we also have to cut this off. So we have to we can't go all the way to the top where we can just use that linear size sets contain um, triangles. This uh, greedy approach at the very end of the absorption, we need some structure that does this with um, so some orchard that does this. This doesn't have linear size, but actually contains a uh, a full uh, triangle factor. Um, so this is what this proposition says. Um, and again, this is slightly technical because of the leftover before. Um, and for this, uh, we use um, more ideas from uh, the previous paper of myself, um, Yuri Person and Yoshika Hayakawa. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, these ideas sort of date back to, to Richard Montgomery and with his work on um, spanning trees in, um, in random graphs and, and have found many applications. Um, so it's, it's another type of absorption using robust bipartite graphs. Um, yeah, so it's, it's basically a, a completely different approach here. Uh, and this, using these ideas, plus um, this idea of orchards, so using the fact that we can use big orchards, um, manages to give this absorbing structure that finishes it. Uh, okay, so we have a new picture, which I'll go briefly. So now we can um, jump uh, in order by n to the epsilon each time. Um, so now the t is really uh, some large constant and we've cut off the absorption when we're at, um, when, our, when our orchards have order uh, n to the one minus epsilon. And uh, right, I think I'll skip through this stuff and uh, just talk about some open problems. Uh, right, yes, yeah, so the, um, for cliques, for larger cliques, uh, we get the same condition. Um, well, the, the corresponding condition. Um, and the big, the big uh, difference in the in the picture for larger cliques is that we have no construction. Okay, so this is uh, this could be tight. It, many people believe that there are pseudo random graphs that are slightly short of this condition that don't even contain a uh, kr plus one. Um, but we we have no idea already for k4, um, such constructions seem hard to find. Um, and in fact, it was shown recently by Mubai and Frustrate that if these things do exist, these, these pseudo random clique free uh, graphs, then it would close the gap on, on uh, off diagonal Ramsey numbers. So this is a very big 
open problem. Uh, the best known currently is um, Anurag Bishnoi, uh, Valentina Pepe and Ferdinand Eringer. Um, they have the best construction for, but it's still a way off what people believe, which is this condition. Um, as far as upper bounds, we conjecture that uh, we should get what happens when R equals two. So actually this condition should not just give a clique vector, but any maximum degree R subgraph. Um, but I expect this to be much harder than the uh, R equals two case. Because uh, there we have, we know the structure of uh, max degree two graphs. For other graphs, this is much more difficult. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, I want to say that this is sort of the first um, result of this kind uh, in that we don't know for other spanning structures what the optimal condition is um, on pseudo randomness. So even for Hamilton cycle, it was conjectured by Prevelius and Sudakov that one would only need lambda to be a little low of D um, in 2003. And they have uh, in the same paper, they give a condition which has a log factor um, like log, uh, what is it? Like log log squared over log 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 d, um, and that's uh, to this date the best known condition. So that no one's improved on that since. So any any uh, progress on that would be very interesting. And yeah, thank you for for listening. Thank you very much. Um, you can all unmute yourself and clip. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. I might just start because I'm curious. In Rikos, Rikos proof, he, he doesn't really need the orchards, right? He talks about chains of paths. Right. So the like, do, do, do you really need this orchard, like general general trees somewhere in your group? Yeah, yeah. So the um, exactly. So his his would work with any trees. Um, and he just chooses paths for some simplicity. Mm -hmm. um, we really need, in order to, yeah, actually in several places, we really need a, a tree with more structure. Um, so you can't, you can't find, um, you can find paths. You can force that you, you find large paths or, or paths of any size, but as uh, other trees, it's sort of, um, it's not possible to guarantee that such a diamond tree exists with a fixed tree. Um, so something more, um, so for example, a, uh, a star would be great. If we could find large diamond stars, that would yeah. be fantastic, but this is not possible. So, but what you can do is you can, you can force a minimum degree on the non leaves of a tree. And this is, this is really helpful. So this gives a lot of um, oh. flexibility. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and you need that in the rest of the proof. I think I just asked. Yeah, so you need this, you basically need this um yeah throughout. So so to um effectively you you want uh you want diamond trees which which sort of behave their removable vertices behave well. Uh, mm -hmm. they're sort of typical and a priori guaranteed. But if you have, for example, um if I could find stars, so I can find stars of, of reasonable size, but not linear size, then this gives flexibility because stars have many leaves. So I can, if I had a large star, I could take a random subset of leaves and this guarantees some good properties on the removable vertices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> are there any other questions? No other questions, but thanks for the nice talk with the nice pictures. And I just kept thinking about diamond trees and my mind would go, wow. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I do have a cold and my mind's a bit fuzzy at the moment, but yeah, thank you. The beer stock is going to drop now that we know diamond trees are easy to find, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, if not, then let's just all thank Patrick again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>